In this presentation, we will consider the scripture block of 3rd Nephi, chapters 17 through 19. So let's take a look at some of the principles and doctrines that will help us come unto Christ. 3rd Nephi, 17 through 19. So let's begin with 3rd Nephi, chapter 17. 17 verse 2, the phrase, I perceive that ye are weak, that you cannot understand all my words. Jesus perceived that they were in a weakened condition, both mentally and physically. In his wisdom and mercy, he gave them time to ponder upon the things which they had received, to refresh themselves and prepare to receive additional instructions the next day. President Harold B. Lee adapts these words to our day when, at the close of General Conference, he said, quote, God be with you. I have the same feeling as perhaps the Master had when he bid goodbye to the Nephites. He said he perceived that they were weak, but if they would go to their homes and ponder on what he said, he would come again and instruct them on, another, on other occasions. So likewise, you cannot observe all that you have heard and that we have talked about, but go to your homes now and remember what you can, and get the spirit of what have been done and said. And when you come again, or we come to you, we will try to help you further with your problems. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 3. Go into your homes and ponder upon the things which I have said. Two important points can be drawn from this statement. First, the Savior is placing a proper emphasis on the family and home for gospel instruction and spiritual experience. King Benjamin, when he instructed his people, also had the people organized every man according to his family. They were taught as families, counseled together as families, pondered and prayed as families. The most important gospel instruction and enduring spiritual impressions will occur within homes. The family is the basic unit of the kingdom of God on earth, declared President Spencer W. Kimball. The church can be no healthier than its families. It is the duty of parents so to teach by example and precept that the children will find the measure of his creation and find his way back to the glories of exaltation. Wise parents will see to it that their teaching is orthodox, character-building, and faith-promoting. It is the responsibility of the parents to teach their children. The Sunday school, the primary, and the MIA and other organizations that role play a secondary role. But and sisters, we need to remember that it is within the family where most of the teaching should and will occur. Second, the Lord is teaching them the importance of pondering as an essential element to acquiring spiritual knowledge. The things of God are not understood through hearing or reading alone. True gospel instruction occurs only as the spirit of revelation teaches and testifies of the truths presented. Man must take time to meditate, President Ezra Tapp Benson has taught, to sweep the cobwebs from his mind so that he might get a more firm grasp on the truth and spend less time chasing phantoms and dallying in projects of lesser worth. Take time to meditate. Ponder the meaning of the work in which you are engaged. The Lord has counseled. Let the solemnities of the earth rest upon your minds. You cannot do that when your minds are preoccupied with the worries and cares of the world. Ponder opens the mind to intellectual insight and understanding and opens the heart to spiritual promptings and assurances. Moroni listed pondering as one of the essential features in gaining the testimony of the Book of Mormon. Nephi told his readers, My soul delighteth in the things of the Lord, and my heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. President Marion G. Romney of the First Presidency described the power of pondering, quote, as I have read the scriptures, I have been challenged by the word ponder, so frequently used in the Book of Mormon. The dictionary says that ponder means to weigh mentally, think deeply about, deliberate, meditate. Pondering is, in my feeling, a form of prayer. It has at least been an approach to the Spirit of the Lord on many occasions. Nephi tells us of one such occasion. 
For it came to pass, he wrote, after I had desired to know the things that my father had seen, and believed that the Lord was able to make them known unto me, as I sat pondering in my heart, I was caught away in the spirit of the Lord, yea, into an exceedingly high mountain. Then follows Nephi's account of the great vision he was given by the Spirit of the Lord because he believed the words of his prophet father and had such great desire to know more than, the, than he pondered and prayed about them. Chapter 17, verse 4. Scattered Israel is not lost unto the Father. Although the scattered tribes of Israel are lost to the knowledge of man, they are not lost to God. He knows where they are, for he knoweth whether he hath taken them. His knowledge of them and the Savior's visit to the lost tribes of Israel suggests the possibility that we will someday have access to other accounts of Jesus' visit to his sheep. Boy, what a glorious that will be to get those records. Elder Neil A. Maxwell observed, Lost books are among the treasures yet to come forth. Over 20 of these are mentioned in the existing scriptures. Perhaps most startling and voluminous will be the records of the lost tribes of Israel. We would not even know of the impending third witness for Christ except through the precious Book of Mormon, the second witness for Christ. This third set of sacred records will thus complete a triad of truth. Then, just as the perfect shepherd has said, my word also should be gathered in one. There will be one fold and one shepherd in a welding together of all the Christian dispensations of human history. End of quote. Chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. Jesus' compassion and healing of the people. Perhaps no chapter in Holy Writ can compare with this in illustrating the good godly attributes possessed by the Savior, tenderness, love, compassion, mercy, and even the display of emotion. It becomes easy to think of the resurrected Lord only in such terms as power, omniscience, and glory. This passage graphically reminds us, as Paul declared, that we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Our love and adoration of the Savior and our commitment to submit wholly to him and follow him with full purpose of heart are enhanced when we understand not only who he is, but also what he is like. This account includes a most touching example of Jesus' tender love and compassion for all that were afflicted with any manner. The mercy he extended and the spiritual blessings he bestowed upon them also serve as a foreshadowing of his millennial ministry when he will come in glory with healing in his wings to prepare for the ultimate triumph of the plan of salvation. In Christ, through his fulfillment of the infinite and eternal sacrifice, all death, pain, disease, sickness, deformities, and handicaps will be done away with, and these old things shall pass away, leaving physically new creatures with bodies and minds renewed in glorious resurrection. Chapter 17, verse 6. My bowels are filled with compassion towards you. The risen Redeemer was filled with compassion and empathy for those who suffered from all manner of physical and emotional ailments, as well as those who suffered spiritually. Because he knew what they felt, he had experienced it. His compassion and mercy had been thoroughly perfected in Gethsemane and on Golgotha as he partook of the bitter cup. His feelings for and hearings of the afflicted at Bountiful were fulfilled were fulfillment of Alma's, Alma's messianic prophecy, and he shall go forth suffering the pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, and this that the word might be fulfilled which said he will take upon him the pains and sickness of his people, and who will take upon him death that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people, and he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Christ knows exactly all of our physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional infirmities, for he took upon them in the garden 
of Gethsemane. Chapter 17, verse 10. They did worship him and did kiss his feet insomuch that they did bathe his feet with their tears. As a result of the miraculous healing which had been performed, the people were overcome with feelings of gratitude and spiritual wonder. Tears of joy, feeling freely flowing, and worshipful praise of love and adoration were poured out upon the Savior. Most of us will not in mortality experience such events such as these, but these attitudes of worship and gratitude and love for the Lord can be experienced and maintained in our mortal life. Worshiping the Lord is more than just feeling. It is much more than sermon and song. True worship requires proper inward attitudes and outward actions, as well as spiritual feelings. To worship the Lord is to follow after Him, to believe His doctrine, and to think His thoughts, declared Elder Bruce R. McConkie. To worship the Lord is to put first in our lives the things of his kingdom, to live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God, to center our whole hearts upon Christ and that salvation which comes because of him. It is to walk in the light as he is in the light, to do the things which he wants done, to do what he would do under similar circumstances, to be as he is. To worship the Lord is to walk in the Spirit, to rise above the carnal things, to bridle our passions, and to overcome the world. Chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus groaned within himself. The Savior's compassion and love for the people, as evidenced by his healing of the sick, also produced a feeling within him much different than the joy previously seen. In direct contrast to the spiritual blessings that were being poured out upon the righteous, Jesus' compassion was turned to the wicked of the house of Israel who would know no such joy and blessings. Jesus' spiritual groaning and the troubled, troubling feelings he demonstrated in prayer to his Father are as much an evidence of his divine concern and compassion as is the account of his healing and blessings of the righteous. This godly concern for both the righteous and the wicked help us to see in him a merciful, loving God who inviteth all to come unto him and partake of his goodness. He denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, and he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. Chapter 17, verses 15 through 20. Mormon records that Jesus' prayer was so remarkable that words can neither record the essence of the Savior's prayer nor capture the spiritual feeling that entered into the hearts of the people as they became witnesses of perfect prayer. The reason that words cannot describe such prayer is not that they are secret, but rather that mortal language cannot adequately capture the language of the Spirit. In the pure and perfect and proper sense, no one can speak or pray in the name of Christ unless he speaks or prays by the power of the Holy Ghost, Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote. It is within our cap capability as the Lord's people to do this because we have the mind of Christ. The kind of perfect communication that the Savior exemplified among the Nephites is born of the Spirit. It is the divine standard we should seek to meet with our own prayers. Chapter 17, verse 21, he wept. We do not have a God who is without passion. Even the great creator of heaven and earth can be filled with emotion, both happiness and sadness, touched to tears by spiritual things, and overcome with love for his people. Chapter 17, verse 21, he took their little children one by one and blessed them and prayed unto the Father for them. Jesus called forth and blessed the Nephite children just as he had done previously during his mortal ministry in the old world. His love for little children is not only evidenced by his divine compassion, but was and also is also symbolic of the requirements of the gospel. The Savior reminds us that in order to partake of the great blessings, even eternal life, you must be converted and become as little children. 
the tender mercies extended by the Savior and his blessings of the little children serve also as a symbolic teaching that through the atonement of Jesus Christ we are able to put off the natural man and becometh as little children. While serving as the general president of the primary, Sister McLean P. Grasley referred to the capacity of children for spiritual experiences. Quote, it's significant to me that the Savior gave the most sacred teachings only to the children, then loosed their tongues so that they could teach the multitude. Is it any wonder that following the Savior's visit to the Nephites, they lived in peace and righteousness for 200 years? Because of miraculous instruction, blessings, and attention they and their children received, righteousness was perpetuated by their children's children for many generations. Let us not underestimate the capacity and potential power of today's children to perpetuate righteousness. No group of people in the church is as receptive to the truth. End of quote. Church members in, Cry in Chile had a similar experience when Spencer W. Kimball visited them. Quote, one of the greatest expressions of love for children that I have ever seen occurred when I was serving as a state president in Chile. President Spencer W. Kimball visited Chile for an area conference. Members of the church from our four countries met together in a stadium that held about 15,000 people. We asked President Kimball what he would like to do after the conference. His eyes full of tears, he said, I would like to see the children. One of the priesthood leaders announced over the microphone that President Kimball would like to shake the hands or bless each of the children in the stadium. The people were ast astounded. There was a great silence. President Kimball greeted about 2,000 children one by one, crying as he took their hands or kissed them or put his hands on their heads and blessed them. The children were very reverent and looked at him and cried too. He said he had never felt this kind of spirit in his life. It was a tremendous moment in the lives of all the church members there. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 24, they were encircled about with fire, and angels did minister unto them. One of the most touching episodes in the Book of Mormon is the result of the Savior's blessing of the little children. This chapter certifies that religion is more than doctrine, more than theology, more than even selfless service. Religion is a thing of the heart. Religion is lived and religion is felt. Being encircled about with fire is a tangible symbol of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let's now turn our attention to 3 Nephi chapter 18. 3 Nephi 18, 1 through 14, instituting the ordinance of the sacrament. Just as he did when his disciples at the last supper with his disciples at the Last Supper in Jerusalem, Jesus introduced to the Nephite disciples that ordinance we know as the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. He previously had taught them that the law of Moses was fulfilled and that old things had passed away. Now he was instructing them concerning a new ordinance to replace animal sacrifice. Just as sacrificial ordinances were rich with sim spiritual symbolism, so too were the sacramental emblems emblem symbolic of the atoning sacrifice of Christ, both body and blood. One symbolic ordinance, the sacrifice of animals, animals look forward in anticipation of the fulfillment of the atonement, and the other, the sacrament, look back in remembrance of the suffering of the Son. This new ordinance is structured Instituted in both the Old and New World was more than just a symbolic teaching methodology to remind the people of Christ. It was in very deed a covenant with a promise. Partaking of the sacrament, Jesus taught this witness unto the Father that you are willing to do that which I have commanded you. Uh, verse 10, also for more in-depth study discussion of the symbolism and covenants associated with the sacrament. Faithfulness to that covenant brings the fulfillment of the Lord's promise that ye shall have my spirit to be with you. Jesus added an additional promise of the spiritual security when he stated, And if you shall always do the things, blessed are ye. 
to do these things, blessed are ye, for ye are built upon my rock. The symbol of bread and wine are not only symbols of the broken flesh and blood of the Redeemer, but are also symbols of sustenance. By taking worthily of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we are not only covenant to remember the Savior's sacrifice, but also demonstrate our yearning, hungry and thirsting for spiritual sustenance. I have always looked upon this blessing privilege as the means of spiritual growth, Elder Melvin J. Ballard taught, and there is none other quite so fruitful in the achievement of that end as partaken worthily of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We eat food to stimulate our physical bodies. Without the partaking of food, we become weak and sickly and frail physically. It is just as necessary for our spiritual body that we partake of this sacrament by it and by it obtain spiritual food for our souls. We must come, however, to the sacrament table hungry. If we should repair to a banquet where the finest of earth's providing may be had, without hunger, without appetite, the food would be not be tempting nor do us any good. If we repair to the sacrament table, we must come hungry and thirsting after righteousness for spiritual growth. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles describes several appropriate ways to remember the Lord while renewing our covenants through the sacrament. Quote, we could remember the Savior's premortal life and all that we know of Him to have done. We could remember the simple grandeur of His mortal birth to just a young woman. We could remember Christ's miracles and His teachings, His healings, and His help. We could remember that Jesus found special joy and happiness in children and said all of us should be more like them. We could remember that Christ called his disciples friends. We could and should remember the wonderful things that have come to us in our lives and that all things which are good cometh of Christ. On some days we will have cause to remember the unkind treatment he received, the rejection he experienced, and the injustice he endured. We can remember that Jesus had to descend below all things before he could ascend above them, and that he suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, that he might be filled with mercy and know how to succor his people in their infirmities. End of quote. Chapter 17, verses 3 through 4 and 8 through 9, a pattern. In verses 3 through 4, the Savior instructs the disciples to first take the bread, eat, and be filled. Then they were to give to the multitude to partake and eat of the bread. The same pattern is repeated for the wine. First the disciples were to partake, and then the multitude. This pattern shows us how the Savior will conduct the affairs of the church. Christ first gives instruction, revelation, etc. to his apostles, and then they give it to the members of the church. Thus, revelation, instruction, etc. for the church will come through Christ, appointed servants and apostles. Chapter 17, verse 7, It shall be a testimony unto the Father that you do always remember me. The covenant to always remember him involves more, much more than just pondering on his mission and sacrifice during the sacrament meeting or mentally recounting events from his life. These things are important, but always remembering him implies motion more than memory, action of service to our fellow men, and obedience to the Lord. In the context of the sacramental covenant, the word remember is linked to the word follow. Fulfilling our covenant to always remember the Lord necessitates following his example and keeping his commandments. Chapter 17, verse 7. Ye shall have my spirit to be with you, the sacrament and the ministering of angels. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how the ministry of angels is also part of the promise of sacramental prayers. Quote, These ordinances of the Aaronic Priesthood are also vital to the ministering of angels. Angelic messengers can be delivered by a voice or merely by thoughts or feelings communicated to the mind. Most angelic communications are felt or heard rather 
than seen. In general, the blessings of spiritual companionship and communication are available only to those who are clean. Through the ironic priesthood ordinance of baptism and the sacrament, we are cleansed of our sins and promise that if we keep our covenants, we will always have his spirit to be with us. I believe that promise, I believe that promise not only refers to the Holy Ghost, but also to the ministering of angels. For angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, they speak the words of Christ. So it is that those who hold the ironic priesthood open the door for all church members who worthily partake of the sacrament to enjoy the companionship of the Spirit of the Lord and the ministering of angels. The Lord's promise to those who worthily partake of the sacrament is the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit. Having the Spirit in our lives produce myriad bless, spiritual blessings. The Spirit helps us recall and recognize truth, conveys to us all manner of spiritual gifts, guides us in our prayers, teaches us eternal truth, brings peace and joy to the soul, opens our minds to revelation, shows and tells us all things that we should do, strengthens the body, mind, and spirit, and many many other things. We sometimes forget how that the sacrament is the renewal of the covenant of baptism, and like baptism has associated with it the significant blessings of the remission of sins. The Holy Ghost is a sanctifier, and always having the Spirit with us ensures a forgiveness of sins. Chapter 17, verses 15 and 18. You must watch and pray always. As important as prayer is, its protective and guiding influence is diminished unless it is coupled with vigilance, vigilance with watching. The doctrinal meaning of the word watch in the context of praying always in order to resist temptation applies implies more than observation. It means being on guard, being spiritually aware. Some erroneously believe that as long as they say their prayers, God will not suffer them to be tempted above that which they are able. Certainly this was not the intent of Paul's words. Adding the words of Alma to those of Paul helps us to better understand why watching must accompany and praying. And now, my brother and Alma said, I wish I wish from the innermost that this should be from. I'm sorry. I wish from... Oh, God, I still didn't fix it, did I? I wish from the innermost part of my heart, yea, with great anxiety, even unto pain, that you would hearken unto my words and cast off your sins and not procrastinate the day of your repentance, but that you would humble yourselves before the Lord and call on his holy name and watch and pray continually that ye may not be tempted above that which ye can bear and thus be led by the Holy Spirit becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of long, full of love and long suffering, having faith on the Lord, having a hope that ye shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in your hearts. One cannot reasonably pray for strength, resist temptation, and then carelessly and recklessly flirt with evil. Just as we are saved by the grace of God only after all we can do, our faith and prayers are efficacious only after all we can do in watching our thoughts, words, and deeds. Least by our own negligence we fall into transgression. If we fail to watch and pray continually, we can indeed be tempted above that which we can bear. I'm sorry, that should be we. We must constantly be watchful as well as prayerful to ensure that our thoughts, words, and deeds stay in the spiritual safe zone. Just as the Savior promised protection to the Nephites, His promise is likewise conveyed to it today through the scriptures and the living prophets who testify that even our diligence should be even.
let's see where am I that even that if even our diligent watchful and prayerful we will be given the strength to shun any temptation let me try that sentence again just as the Savior promised protection to the Nephites his promise is likewise conveyed to is conveyed to us today I'm sorry To us today, through the scriptures of the living prophets, who testify that if even that if even that even if we are dil diligently watchful and prayerful we will be given the strength to shun any temptation. Sorry about those typos. Chapter 17, verse 16 and 24. Behold, I am the light. I have set an example for you. Compare verse 24. Jesus Christ is our example in all things, and as such, he is also our example in prayer. For the works which ye have seen me do, that shall ye also do. For that which you have seen me do, even that shall ye do. Following the Savior's example of prayer requires that we should seek to pray by the power of the Spirit in the same manner as He prayed, having steadfast faith in Christ and living lives of Christ-like actions allows us to think as He thinks, acts as He acts, speak as He speaks, and thus pray as He prayed. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, admonished that whatsoever our role, we should seek to emulate the Savior's character as much as we can. Quote, Each of us plays vital roles in family, church, community, business, education, and so forth. Though we have different needs, we have in common the need to focus on all Christ's qualities, especially those which individually we most need to develop more fully. We can, of course, stop short and merely adopt a few techniques illustrated by the Savior. But unless we emulate him as completely as we can, we will have deprived ourselves of the great model. Moreover, our emulation is to be of both a style and substance. God's love underwrites his listening. For instance, we can conceive of a God, can we conceive of a God who is a non-listener or who is lacking in power or who is unwilling to exert himself on any issue of principle? As we become more like him, it will take place in both attitude, attributes and actions. Chapter 18, verse 18, for Satan desires to have you. Compare Luke 22, 31. The Savior's statement here must be taken as literal. This desire of Satan is the very reason why Jesus, like all of the prophets, constantly commanded us to pray always. In the pre-mortal world, Lucifer sought to destroy agency and thwart the Father's plan of salvation. His destructive designs continue now on earth. President Wilford Woodruff taught Lucifer has great influence over the children of men. He labors continually to destroy the works of God in heaven, and he had to be cast out. He is here, mighty among the children of men. There is a vast number of fallen spirits cast out with him here on earth. They do not die and disappear. They have not bodies they have not bodies only as they enter the tabernacles of men, only as they enter the tabernacles of men. They have not organized bodies and are not to be seen with the sight of the eye. But there are many evil spirits among us, and they labor to overthrow the church and kingdom of God. Do you suppose these devils are around us without trying to do something? I say we have got a mighty warfare to wage with these spirits. We cannot escape it. What will they do to you? They will try to make us do any, anything and everything that is not right. End of quote. Given this graphic view of Satan's evil intentions and his hatred for the children of men, is it no wonder that the Lord repeatedly reminds us to watch and pray always? 18 verse 18. Sift you as wheat. When Jesus warned the Nephites, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He was teaching the same message he had expressed to Peter. 
Elder Bruce R. McClarkey, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained Jesus' words, quote, This is an idiomatic expression which was clear to the people in that day, more so than to people in our day. In essence and thought content, Jesus is saying, Peter, Satan wants you in his harvest. He wants to harvest your soul and bring you into his granary, into his garner, where he will have you as his disciple. It is the same figure that we use when we say that the field is white, ready, already to harvest, and we go out and preach the gospel and harvest the souls of men. Well, Satan wanted Peter. He wanted to sift him as wheat or to harvest his soul. And so today he is trying to do that with all of us, brothers and sisters. Satan is trying to harvest our souls for his cause. May we be ever watchful and prayerful against such doings. Chapter 18, verses 19 through 21, in my name. The Savior admonishes us in this verse to pray in his name. This is more than just saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, at the end of our prayers. From the Bible Dictionary, we learn that it means to, what it means to pray in the name of Christ. We pray in the name of Christ when our minds is the mind of Christ and our wishes the wishes of Christ. When his words abide in us, we then ask for things it is possible for God to grant. Many prayers remain unanswered because they are not in Christ's name at all. They in no way represent his mind, but spring out of the selfishness of man's heart. We, speak, we pray in the name of Christ when the Holy Ghost tells us what to say, and we speak, therefore, the words of Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 18, verse 20, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, which is right, to pray for that which is right can be done in three ways. First, being in tune with the Spirit enables one to know that which is right and that which may be appropriately asked of the Father. When our desires and deeds are in harmony with God's will, we have the promise that all our petitions before the Father will be granted according to our desires. Perfect prayer are always answered, declared Bruce R. McConkie. Proper petitions are always granted. The Lord never rejects a prayer uttered by the power of the Spirit or denies the petition sought in the name of Christ that accords with the divine will. Second, we can know that which is right to pray for by heeding the words of the living prophets as they give counsel and direction on what to pray for. Third, the scriptures are replete with things we should pray for, thus providing us with example of things which are right. Following is a list of those things the scripture tells us to pray for. Now this is quite a long list. We should pray to overcome our enemies and afflictions. The scripture teaches that we should pray to know the mysteries of God. Pray for the salvation of our souls. Pray for the salvation of others. Pray for mercy. Pray about our temporal matters. Pray concerning our families. Pray to escape and conquer Satan. Pray to receive strength and support from God. Pray that all we do is unto the Lord. Pray to be cleansed and made pure by the atonement of Christ. Pray that the work of God will go forth among the nations. Pray for our enemies. Pray for the coming of the Savior to avenge the righteous. Pray for the Lord's leaders. Pray for the Holy Ghost to be given to us. Pray for forgiveness. Pray to give thanks. Pray for charity. Pray to bless the bread and water of the sacrament. Pray for wisdom. Pray for that which we stand in need of. Pray to know the truth about Christ and his gospel. Pray for revelation. Pray for the gifts of the Spirit. Pray for temples and temple work. Pray for civic leaders. Pray for the welfare of others. Pray for un to understand the scriptures. Pray to endure to the end. Pray for more missionaries. That is a list of what the scriptures tell us to pray for. Those are things that are right that we should pray for. If we pray for those things, then we are praying for that which is right. Chapter 18, verse 21, pray in your families. President Gordon B. Hinckley specified how wives, children, and families are blessed through family prayer. Quote, I feel satisfied that there is no adequate substitute for the morning and the evening practice of kneeling together, father, mother, and children. This more than all, so, 
Th this, more than soft carpet, more than lovely draperies, more than cleverly balanced color schemes, is the thing that will make for better and more beautiful homes. What miracles would happen in the lives of children of the world if they would lay aside their own selfishness and lose themselves in the service of others? The seed from which this sheltering and faithful tree may grow is best planted and nurtured in the daily supplications of the family. I know of no better way to inculcate love for country than for parents to pray for their children for the land in which they live, invoking the blessings of the Almighty upon it, that it may be preserved in liberty and peace. I know of no better way to build within the hearts of our children a much-needed respect for authority than remembering in daily supplications of the family the leaders of our respective countries who carry the burdens of government. I know of nothing that will so much help to to case family tent to ease, that should be ease, sorry. To ease family tensions, that in a subtle way will bring about the respect for parents, which leads to obedience, that will affect the spirit of repentance, which will largely ease the burden of broken homes, then will praying together, confessing weakness before the Lord, and invoking the blessing of the Lord upon home and those who dwell there. Can we make our homes more beautiful? Yes, through addressing ourselves as families to the Savior of all true beauty. Can we strengthen society and make it a better place in which to live? Yes, by strengthening the virtue of our family life through kneeling together and supplicating the Almighty in the name of His beloved Son. This practice, a return to family worship spreading across at across the and over the earth would in generations largely lift the blight that is destroying us. It would restore integrity, mutual respect, and a spiritual of thank a spirit of thankfulness in the hearts of the people. Sorry, there's a little typo there in that sentence. There's an extra there. Chapter eighteen verses twenty two to twenty five. Ye shall meet together oft, and ye shall not forbid any man from coming unto you when ye shall meet together. After establishing a new church and giving them the teachings and ordinances of a higher righteousness, Jesus now commands the multitude to meet together oft to teach and edify one another. They were to forbid none from coming and partaking of the blessings of the church. We like they are under commandment to help influence all to come unto Christ through our prayers, our example, and our specific invitations to hear the gospel word. Failing to extend the hand of fellowship to our brothers and sisters, regardless of their differences from us, is antithetical to the spirit of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we will repel the spirit both institutionally and individually. Ella Russell M. Ballard observed, I believe we members do not have the option to extend a hand of fellowship only to relatives, close friends, certain members of church, and those selected non-members who express an interest in the church, sorry, that should be in the church. Limiting our withholding our fellowship seems to me to be contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We might ask ourselves how the newcomers in our ward would be treated if we were the only ones they ever met. Every member of the church should foster that attitude attributes of warmth, sincerity, and love for the newcomers. Brothers and sisters, we, rem we members must help with the conversion process by making our wards and branches friendly places with no exclusivity where all people feel welcome and comfortable. My message is urgent because we need to retain in full fellowship many more of the new converts and return to activity many more of the less active. I urge you to increase the spirit of fellowship a friendship and pure Christian fellowship in your neighborhoods. A new convert, a recently activated member, should feel the warmth of being wanted and welcomed, being welcomed into full fellowship of the church. Members and leaders of the church should nurture and love them as Jesus would. End of quote. Chapter 18, verse 24. I am the light in which ye shall hold up. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught his disciples, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father 
which is in heaven. To the Nephites, he declared that he is the light which we are to hold up, the light of the world. Only through him can we become a light to the world. There is both an individual and institutional application of this passage. First, individually, we hold up Christ as the light of the world in our lives as we take upon his name upon us, have his image engraven in our countenance by personifying his teachings and by receiving his spirit. Second, as an institution, the church is commanded to hold up Christ, hold Christ up to the world as the light that illuminates our way and gives life and meaning to all that we do. In all our ministering and meetings, he should be our focal point and the object of our attention and our adoration. Others who observe our institutional efforts must be able to perceive that in the institutional church, as well as in our li individual lives, we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ. Chapter 18, verse 25. Whosoever breaketh this commandment suffereth himself to be led into temptation. This phrase may have two meanings, both of which are appropriate. In the context of the passage, Jesus has commanded his Nephite listeners to pray for and fellowship others and not forbid any man from coming unto the church. Jesus could be saying that those who break the commandments will be led in temptation by virtue of their own pride and self-righteousness. Pride and selfishness always leads to the breaking of other commandments. A possible second meaning of this phrase could refer to the Savior's commandment, that ye should come unto me, that ye might feel and see. Those who refuse the Savior's invitation and break his commandments to come unto him and will not hold him up as their light are inevitably led into temptation and fall to transgression. Both meanings represent true doctrine. It is clear that the Lord is reminding us that breaking our covenant to always remember him or to succor those that stand in need of our succor will leave us devoid of the spirit and open to the wiles of the devil. Blessings always follow obedience, and disobedience always results in condemnation. Chapter 18, verses 26 to 32, a sacred ordinance. Notice that in 3 Nephi eighteen twenty-six, the Savior ceased speaking to the multitude and turned to the leaders whom he had chosen. His message in verses 28 through 29 was given to priesthood leaders as a warning against allowing the unworthy to partake of the sacrament. We learn from these verses that members of the church did leave the responsibility of determining worthiness to partake of the sacrament to those the Lord has called to make such judgments, such as the bishop or stake president. While serving as member of the Seventy, Elder John H. Goldberg explained what is meant to partake of the sacrament worthily, quote, if we desire to improve, which is to repent, and are not under priesthood restriction, then in my opinion we are worthy. If, however, we have no desire to improve, if we have no intention of following the guidance of the Spirit, we must ask, are we worthy to partake? Or are we making a mockery of the very purpose of the sacrament, which is to act as a catalyst for personal repentance and improvement? If we remember the Savior and all that he has done and will do for us, we will improve our actions and thus come closer to him, which keeps us on the road to eternal life. If, however, we refuse to repent and improve, if we do not remember him and keep his commandments, then we have stopped our growth, and that is damnation to our souls. The sacrament is an intensely personal experience, and we are the ones who knowingly are worthy or otherwise. As we worthily partake the sacrament, we will sense those things we need to improve in and receive the help and determination to do so. No matter what our problems, the sacrament always gives hope. Most of those problems we must work out ourselves. For example, if we aren't paying our tithing, we must simply determine to start doing so. But for some problems, we must see our bishop. The Spirit will let us know which. End of quote. 18 verse 35. It is expedient that I should go unto the Father for your sakes. In order to more perfectly fulfill his mission to the Nephites, it was necessary for Jesus to return to his Father. The record does not say why or what he received from the Father. See commentary on 3 Nephi 17, 3 through 4. Give you more insight on that. Chapter 3, I'm sorry, 3 Nephi chapter 19. 
In chapter 19, we get a glimpse into the calling of the 12 disciples, apostles Jesus had chosen among the Nephites. Following are the duties, callings, and mission of apostles as described in chapter 19. 1, 3 Nephi 19, 6, the 12 are to teach the people. 2, 3 Nephi 19, 7, they are to pray to the Father in the name of Christ, meaning to pray as directed by the Spirit. 3, 3 Nephi 19, 8, they teach only the words of Jesus, nothing varying, not their own opinions. 4, 3 Nephi 19, 9, they are to have righteous desires and pray for them, that the Holy Ghost be given to them to help them in their ministry. 5, 3 Nephi 19, 12, they are to administer the ordinances of the gospel. 6, 3 Nephi 19, 13, they are born again and filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 7, 3 Nephi 19, 14, angels minister to them. 8, 3 Nephi 19, 15, the Savior ministers to them. 9, 3 Nephi 19, 20, they are chosen because of their belief in Jesus. 10, 3 Nephi 19, 23, the Savior prays for them and those who believe in the twelve. 11, 3 Nephi 19, 24, because of the obedience and faith, they are given what they should pray for and filled with desire. 12, 3 Nephi 19, 25, the Savior's countenance shines upon them and they became as white as the Savior, meaning sanctified. 13, 3 Nephi 19, 28 through 29. Because of their faith, they are purified by the Savior, and those who believe in the twelve are also purified. 14, 3 Nephi 19, 30. The Savior did smile, meaning approve, upon them because of their steadfastness. 15, 3 Nephi 19, 35 through 66. Because of their great faith, they were able to behold great miracles and hear great things. Chapter 19, verses 9 through 15. The record testifies that the greatest thing for which disciples prayed was that they could receive the Holy Ghost and experience in their own lives what had been demonstrated by the Savior. They understood that this reception of the Holy Ghost was imperative for their apostolic ministry to give them power that would attend their words and works. After Nephi was baptized and had baptized the other disciples in fulfillment of the Lord's charge, the Holy Ghost was poured out upon them in a remarkable Pentecostal manner with fire and the ministration of heavenly beings. The cleansing, sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost not only spiritually prepared these disciples for the subsequent ministry to the people, but also transfigured them so that they could enter the presence of glorified heavenly beings. While the disciples were thus being attended by angels, Jesus reappeared and began to teach the multitude. President Marion G. Romney, the second counselor of the first presidency, stated that we can obtain and keep the spirit of, by following a simple four-point program. If you want to obtain and keep the guidance of the spirit, you can do so by following this simple four-point program. One, pray. Pray diligently. Second, study and learn the gospel. Third, live righteously. Repent of your sins. Fourth, give service in the church. End of quote. Chapter 19, verses 10 through 13, Baptized Anew. President Joseph Finley Smith explained why Jesus commanded the Nephites to be baptized again. When Christ appeared to the Nephites on this continent, he commanded them to be baptized, although they had been baptized previously for the remission of their sins. The Savior commanded Nephi and the people to be baptized again because he had organized anew the church under the gospel. Before that, it had been organized under the law. And so this time to be baptized, become members of the newly organized church. For the same reason, Joseph Smith and those who had been baptized prior to April 6, 1830, were baptized on the day of the organization of the church. End of quote. Chapter 19, verses 18 through 22, they did pray unto Jesus. The Savior had previously instructed Nephites concerning the proper language of prayer. They knew that they should pray unto the Father in my name. Yet under the influence of the Spirit, they prayed to Jesus, calling him their Lord and their God. 
He was and is both Redeemer and God. In reverential worship, they directed their prayers to the Savior, and he did not stop them nor correct them. It appears that in this case, it was appropriate because a resurrected God stood in their very presence. Ella Bruce R. McConkie has written, quote, Jesus was present before them as the symbol of the Father. Seeing him, it was as though they saw the Father. Praying to him, it was as though they prayed to the Father. It was a special and unique situation that, as far as we know, has taken place only once on earth during all the long ages of the Lord's handling and the Lord's hand dealing with his children. Chapter 19, verse 23 through 29, a prayer for unity. Jesus prayed to Heavenly Father for unity among his followers and for unity among the people his followers taught. Christ also taught the principle of unity and doctrine and covenants. I say unto you, be one, and if you're not one, you're not mine. Christ is not interested in diversity, brothers and sisters. Don't get caught up in that false philosophy. Christ is in, interested in unifying us and become unified and one in Christ. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland compared Jesus Christ's prayer for unity in 3 Nephi 19, 23 with John 17, 11, 23 quote, From the Savior's language, we see clearly it is the Holy Ghost that provides such unity, a doctrinal point not so clearly communicated in the New Testament account. Furthermore, it is significant that one of the ultimate evidences God has of our belief in deity is that we are seen and heard praying. Christ noted this evidence on behalf of the Nephites. To the Father he said, Thou seest that they believe in me because, they, because thou hearest them. It is the key to the miraculous manifestation of heaven and the personal companionship of the holy comforters. End of quote. Elder Todd D. Christopherson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how we might become one with the Father and the Son. Quote, Jesus achieved perfect unity with the Father by submitting himself, both flesh and spirit, to the will of the Father. The Savior's ministry was always clear, clearly focused because there was no deliberating or distracting double-mindedness in him. Referring to his Father, Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. Surely we will not be one with God and Christ until we make their will and interest our greatest desire. Such submissiveness is not reached in a day, but through the Holy Spirit the Lord will tutor us if we will willingly until, in process of time, it may accurately be said that he is in us as the Father is in him. At times I tremble to consider what may be required, but I know that it is only in this perfect union that a fullness of joy can be found. End of quote. Chapter 19, verse 24. For it was given unto them what they should pray. True prayer is a gift of the Spirit. When our attitude and actions are in harmony with the mind and will of God, the Holy Ghost inspires us as we pray and guides our words. When the saints pray in the Spirit, they find their prayers given to them from above. They find their words being their words reaching beyond their thoughts, their hearts open to people and principles and ideas that they had not considered previously. This kind of prayer, prayer directed, motivated by the power of the Holy Ghost, is a revelatory experience. Because our hearts have begun to tell our minds things they did not know before, we learn something from what is uttered. True prayer, brothers and sisters, then, is when the Holy Ghost tells us what to pray for. And that takes a lot of effort and pondering and meditating. Chapter 19, verse 24, they were filled with desire. Faith and spiritual desire leads one to yearn to commune with God. Sincere prayer yields further desire to know God and to live a life that is pleasing to Him. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ gives life and power to personal desire and moves one to action. Prayer is vocalized faith, and when accompanied by the Spirit, it fills the soul with increased love for God and desire to serve him and keep his commandments. 19 verse 25, the light of his countenance did shine upon them. There are two ways in which the Lord's countenance did shine upon them, one literally and the other symbolic. 
From the context of this verse, we can see that there was a little transfiguration of the disciples and that they were filled with light and their countenance shone with light like that of the Savior. They were also filled with the Spirit that they shone with a literal light and glory. In a more symbolic way, we experience the countenance of the Lord shining upon us like the Nephites when we feel of the Savior's perfect love for us, His compassion and His approbation. Though we may not literally in this life see the smiling face of God, we can nonetheless feel the smile and joy of the Lord as we please Him through the service, through service and obedience. Chapter 19, verse 29. I pray not for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me out of the world because of their faith. The saints are called to live in the world, though they are counseled to not to be not of the world. They cannot make a difference in a wicked world, cannot be the salt of the earth or light of the world if they seclude themselves from the world. The blessings of the gospel cannot be obtained by the wicked and the worldly. The Savior's promises are bestowed upon those who come from who come out from the world through faith, repentance, and obedience to all the gospel laws and ordinances. It is to them that the Savior prays for. Chapter 19, verse 33, And their hearts were opened, and they did understand in their hearts. The beauty of the Savior's inspired prayers cannot be captured by mortal words, but can be heard by hearts that have been opened by the Spirit, and understood by minds and spirits that are quickened by the power of the Holy Ghost. True conversion comes when we understand the gospel in our hearts, not just in our minds. It is in our hearts that the Holy Ghost can burn doubt out of us and give us a sure understanding or witness of the truth. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for listening. Hopefully this has been of some help in learning doctrines and principles that will help us come under Christ. If it has been of help, please hit the like button.